Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Valley PBS. Today we are chatting with Janelle Howard, Gallery Director of Arts Visalia, Colton Dennis, Executive Director of the Merced Arts Council, Michelle Ellis Pracy, Director and Chief Curator of the Fresno Art Museum, and Bruce Kane, Executive Director of King's Art Center. They have generously agreed to share some of their experience with us. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. So art, joy, a love of creation, being able to view the creation of others. Let's talk about art in this whole region of Central California and the role of each of your organizations in, in, in presenting art and in developing art. So let's start with you, Janelle. Talk about the art that you present and the art that you help to create. Arts Visalia is one of several organizations in Visalia, California. We are a nonprofit. Um, we have a monthly exhibition uh, that we change out every month. And then we also provide children's and adult art classes. So our mission is to promote the arts as central to the quality of life in our community. And we do that through educating, enriching, and engaging our community. So who creates what you exhibit? We have a wide variety of different artists that display their work every month. And um, it, they kind of submit artwork to us and then we select from there through an exhibition committee. So we create the art, isn't, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Our community does. And then we view the art and we enjoy the art and we share the art mm -hmm. and you become the enabling uh, platform for all that to happen. Yes. <laughs> so Colton, you are the executive director of the Merced Arts Council. You're enabling these types of programs. Talk about the work of the Merced Arts Council. Yeah, the um, Arts Council manages the Multicultural Arts Center in Merced. And through that, we showcase uh, local and international artists through our galleries. We have classes. We have um, an enrichment program for adults with disabilities. That's all arts all the time, Monday through Friday. Uh, and our mission is to inspire and nurture arts and artists in our community and you know, create dialogue and community and um, bring people together, make it a, a hub for the arts. And Michelle, you direct and you are the chief curator of the Fresno Art Museum. Talk about the challenges of running a, an art museum in a place like Fresno and talk about your audiences. The Fresno Art Museum is 69 years old. It has been in the same location in central Fresno for all of those years. Started out as an art center, very modest, became an actual bona fide museum in 81. Has had huge capital campaigns to build out this little um, cinder block building um, into a 30,000 square foot space. And we do have an international reputation built over those years for who we exhibit, which tend to be uh, regional, local, regional, and international artists. Uh, we do original exhibitions now that I'm there. We come up with our concepts, we curate our own shows, and they have they touch the hearts of anybody who walks in our door. Whether it's a child, we have a huge educational program. We have school children in our building every weekday uh, from nine to three or four and a classroom. And then we have five exhibition spaces, five galleries as well. And Bruce, uh, talk about the King Art Center, King's Art Center. So I think similar to all the other art centers represented here, our, our goal is to bring art to our communities through exhibit, through experience, and through education. Um, so those are the three hallmarks that we strive for. We have a large children's program. We have two exhibit spaces. We change out our show um, about seven or eight times a year in those two spaces. Um, and I think you asked the challenges earlier, and I think the challenge, and maybe you guys agree, is that we're art centers in an agriculture-rich region and while we strive to enrich the lives of our community through fine art, um, sometimes it's hard to convince a rural agriculture community that fine art has real value to our community and our place. So let's, let's engage with that. Let's talk about the value of fine art. The thing that always strikes me is that art really is an everyday event, right? If we listen to music, if we are sitting here talking, there's an art to communicating, there's a cadence to communicating, there's a rhythm to communicating. Sport is art in action. Mm -hmm. It just happens to have a different type of a venue. Is, is it any less than ballet? 
Um, no, the, the skills are, are consonant with, with any physical uh, type of performance. And yet we somehow make a distinction where we put art on it with you know, big letters and gold and so on that somehow it's, it's somehow estranged from us. What's going on in this society where, you know, the, if you look at American furniture, if you look at uh, the, the things that were created, the, the structures that were created, the implements that were created in our history, there's so much art that comes, that flows from Native Americans through colo the colonial period, through the revolutionary and the industrial period, but somehow we've created some sort of a distinction. What is going on here that we are satisfied with that dichotomy that you described? Several things pop into my mind, but I think one thing is we have this tendency to limit art, you know, that golden word that we put on, on walls of museums, to these two-dimensional things that only serve the purpose of visual experience. And whereas you describe, and I think rightly so, that art finds its way into so many avenues of expression in life. Whereas for Native Americans, the artistry of their rugs, their carpets, their blankets was everyday expression of artistic expression. And everyday utility. Everyday utility. We have somehow um, limited our idea of art to a more narrow definition. And that's a struggle. How do we break those kinds of categories? Because in a sense, you know, if we take a look at, for example, uh, the discipline of directing a museum, of curating, curating in a sense, it creates that separation because you, you're all of a sudden looking at objects devoid often from their cultural context. How do you create in Fresno a, a, an environment that encourages the embrace of art and, and not just sort of the antiseptic coming in and looking at, at something that is placed on a wall? I very much believe that I just don't put out the art on the wall without writing a lot of wall text. So that if people want to learn the story and their experience will go deeper than just looking at something on the wall and wondering why, they have the information right there. And I, well, I'm an educator, that's what I am. And whether my exhibitions are purely sculptural or two-dimensional or thematic or uh, I have a painter from the Bay Area right now to still life. I talk about the still life tradition, what does that mean? And also, I'm a true believer in the children. We are not, uh, we don't s turn our back on anybody. And when the children come through that museum, they may have never been in a museum in their lives, and they're in seventh grade. But they come to this museum, they have a classroom where they actually do a project based on the exhibitions that they see. They learn museum etiquette. They know how far to stand back from the wall. They know to keep their backpacks in front of them in their arms or leave them at the desk. No drinks and no water. So if they went to MoMA in New York, they would know, oh, I better leave my backpack you know, with co coat check. I better not carry a pencil with me. So we're, we are educators, whether it's cultural, aesthetic, uh, social, responsible, and the children love it. They love it. And we start there in this area of the country. That's where we start, is with the children. Because the grown-ups come in already comfortable. And you encourage the creation as well. With the, with the visits, there are also projects that are about We have creation. a classroom. And so once they're finished with their experiences in the galleries, they go to the classroom. They actually take what they saw and learned, and they make something from that. And Colton, you also develop uh, programs as well. But you don't necessarily have a museum to uh, kickstart those programs uh, with? No, we have um, art galleries and we do have exhibitions every six to eight weeks that we put in something new, something that's local or something regional or some, we're connected with, um, well, UC Merced is a new University of California and uh, because of them we get artists coming through our area now, we get to get those kind of artists. Uh, last year I had someone from Spain, a Spanish artist that brought in her art and, and it opened your mind to what art is because this wasn't paintings on the wall, this was um, recycled material that was blown up and it took over the whole gallery, it floated in, in, in the air and she made things that were kinetic that when you pass by it, it would move, you know, it would do something. And, and so it, 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 it sparked a lot of conversation. Some of it thought it looked like trash, you know. Some people were amazed how amazing, you know, how cool it was that, that this thing would move. It was something that would look like a white trash bag. Uh, it would be uh, almost like it was um, uh, crinkled up. 
And then when you pass by it, it would blow up and start to breathe. Mm. And it would awe people how amazing that was. And uh, uh, young kids to, to uh, the older generation. And, um, and that to me is um, what part of our job is too, is to um, open those boundaries up to what art is because it is all kinds of things. How do you make sure that people are aware that you're not, you don't have the same people who constantly are coming, that you're constantly refreshing, your audience is bringing in young people. How do you advocate for the idea of art and experiencing art? Some of the ways that we reach out to people because we have various, various age groups of the public. Um, social media attracts a lot of younger generation. Do you make use of social media? We do, we have Instagram, Facebook, Twitter every <laughs> once in a while. We're not too <laughs> adverse on that. Uh, and then we also have the newspaper, you know, or essentially the newspaper itself, you know, it's not necessarily going door to door. People are reading it online. Right. But we're still submitting um, these things to, to advertising agencies, to newspapers that are promoting it for us. So marketing in different ways is how we kind of reach the different age groups because you're not necessarily going to reach an older generation on the social media. So this requires a set of business skills, right? The mm -hmm. first thing you have to do is look at your target, your targets. You have to be able to do market segmentation. You have to understand who the cohorts are and you have to know, for example, that younger people use Instagram and older people might use uh, the traditional newspaper even if they read it online, mm -hmm. right? And then you have to shape a message that will appeal mm -hmm. and you have to get that out within enough time to front the exhibition or the event or the program that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And then when you have that interest, you have to capture that and convert it into something else, whether it's attendance or a paid ticket or, or, or whatever it happens to be. Do you find yourself dealing with the same issue? Oh yeah, um, we use social media a lot. Luckily though, because of the UC, uh, we have students that are kind of interns with all other nonprofits in our, uh, in our town, uh, City of Merced, and they partnered up with the, the Art Center. And so I have a team of Merced, uh, University of California Merced students that um, do the marketing of that, of the social media. So the Instagram, the Twitter, and Facebook, I can give them certain projects, not everything, but, but certain things, and they're learning at the same time. But they're, they're going towards their age group, which I want to connect with as well, right? And so they know what, what their age group would want. And so I, they, we've only been doing this for two years, but they've been doing a great job at that, of communicating what we want to try to communicate through their way of communicating, through their social media. So you're co-opting your audience to become advocates for more audience. Exactly, I think that it, it, with volunteers as well, right? Um, the more people we include, the, the more they talk about it, the more they say, hey, you know, there's someone out of town, um, we need to come to the art center, you know, you need to check it out. Um, the more people we have included, the more they communicate what is available because they're a part of it. They have a buy-in to what's going on. And so they want, they want to include their friends and family as well. And I agree with my colleagues. Um, Facebook is huge. Uh, to move to a new city of 700,000 people, to a museum that had been around for 60, at that point, six, 67 years, and being totally new to the scene, um, I needed to start reaching out, you know, cementing uh, the future of the organization. So Facebook, I do that myself. I do that at night, on the weekends. Anything needs to be put on Facebook comes my way. I have a PR person. We do an e-blast newsletter every week or every two weeks to over 5,000 people across the country, not just regionally. And we do mailings constantly for people who love things in the mailbox because yeah. we have a lot of older people who've supported this museum for 69 years. So when you are a destination and you are an island, basically, of culture, you have to bring people to you. And that, that marketing and communication skill and the financial management skill is so important. If you take a look around any town, not just this town, you see movie theaters that are all closed. Those are businesses that fail to attract uh, right. audiences. Retail outlets, that fa department stores, grocery stores mm -hmm. that fail to attract. But these cultural institutions, they exist because the business acumen that's right. In their sector mm -hmm. of their leaders. That's right. Of their leaders. 
So when you take a look at what is going on at, at your organization, how do you ensure that, that you connect with your audience and that that dialogue is not just a one-off where people come and then they, they've sort of experienced, but that's it. How do you, how do you create stickiness? I think uh, that question is why we all have jobs, right? We have to create that stickiness and, and make sure, otherwise someone could just slap the art on the walls and walk away and it would take care of itself. Right, you see it once and you've seen it, but you don't have to come back. Right. Um, I was recently, my first opportunity to see the Louvre in Paris, and I was astounded by the difference between the way that tourists experience that building and the way locals experience that building. There were groups of locals who were sitting on the floor sketching from a Raphael piece right. and, and working in the midst of museum space. There were um, little clatches of locals who were sitting and talking and just enjoying community in the midst of that right. space. And we're a destination. We go to look at the art and walk away. So It's background noise. If you're a local, it's background noise, but it's such wonderful background noise. Right. Would, would that we all had such Essential art to be... Life. That's right. Right. That's there. Right. So I think, you know, part of our jobs is that strategic thinking. How do we create a variety of events that draw people into new experiences with art and with artists? And I think experiencing the artist, talking about that artist who brought um, reused items into the space. She's telling a story or he's telling a story and, and getting our visitors engaged with that person and their story and their point. Um, makes art so much more meaningful and gives us a chance to draw them into the next story, the next meaningful experience. I love the point that you made about the Louvre and how people who are local experience a museum because to me what that's saying is that your intention for your institution, and perhaps it's the intention that you all have, is to make the institution, the idea of art and being around art to be so routine mm -hmm that it just is part of everyday life. Right. You're not- It enriches us constantly. Mm -hmm. Right, you and you can, you can pay attention to a particular work, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be this all-encompassing thing. You can, you can have a cafe clutch with mm -hmm. some in front of an artwork and glance at it a little bit. Maybe it grabs your attention that day, but maybe it's tomorrow, but you're always right. there and it's always around you. Right. How do you transform the urban environment? If you explode the walls of, of institutions and you look at rural and rural environments, how do, you, how do you bring art outside of the walls of structures, your gallery structures, your museum, and so on? How do you create that sensibility, try and, trying to fulfill what Bruce described as sort of the art in the everyday and, and that everyday conversant um, aspect? Of, of being part of that, that creation. The most important thing for you to be is relevant to your community. Mm -hmm. However you manipulate that, mold that, create that, be relevant to them or they're not going to care. They're not going to make you part of living and breathing and experiencing their daily life. So that's been a real cause for me in my position is to be relevant to my community. We do a fashion show every other year, which is a huge yeah. fundraiser called Fashion. How do you do, a, fa do oh. a fashion show? You've got so many different cultures, right? We, you have so we many we different languages. How does that work? All the artists in the community who wish to make fashion out of recycled materials, we work with them over a year period and we they present portfolios. Uh, we try to bring in a mix of culture and ages. Do you have a judging process? They, yeah, and they bring in mo we bring in models. We have a model call. This year, we really we could have been Fashion Week in New York City. We rented an airplane hangar, and <laughs> it brought in about sixty five thousand dollars, which is a good chunk of change. Typically, it used to bring in like thirty five, but we involve the whole community, and the artists know we care about them. The people that support us love the event you know so they pay for their dinner it's just it's joyful when we can break down the walls and be a community organization and not just what's inside sometimes it's also putting yourself in someone else's environment so you're reaching out um, but you're going to you know local baseball game and you're promoting the arts there or you're going to the farmers market and you're doing kids projects at the farmers market so you're kind of putting yourself in the world that they see and integrating art that way. You're taking the columns down, you're taking mm -hmm. the gold gilt off of the letters, you're making art be part of the ballpark. Mm -hmm. You're making art be part of the market. Mm -hmm. 
you're actually exploding the walls that the arts have sometimes placed between themselves and their audience. How do you make sure that that, that funding works? Each of you have your different, <laughs> yes, I know, big sigh. It's a strategy. Big sigh. How, how do you, because you have, you have contributed revenue, certainly. Uh, there are earned income elements that attach to various services and programs that you have. How does that work for you, for example? So, it's multi-tiered. I mean, uh, luckily, I, I can I apply for grants uh, from the California Arts Council. We get some grants. Membership dues from members of uh, the community. Um, but, you know, um, we, our galleries are free to the public. Right. So, it, it's free Tuesday through Saturday. And, you know, the thing is, we need the funding somehow. So, um, it, it's up to the public to kind of have ownership of that. You know, th this is their art center. Right. And, and even though it's free, it's, it's not right. free. I mean, we still have to pay the bills. I mean, summertime, the air conditioning now, it's like I have to pay, it's almost, uh, you know, up to $30,000 uh, for the whole summer to pay for the air conditioning and the lighting yeah. and all that kind of stuff that yeah, goes on in the art center. Off. You <laughs> can't just turn it off. 106? No way. So, you know, it's always communicating to the public how important it is and that, it, you know, what if we d weren't here anymore? What would you do? I mean, uh, my focus has been on the art center is to make it a hub. And it's not always art. Sometimes it's some uh, political event. Sometimes it's some forum, uh, health fair. But, the, but it, it's immersed in art, yeah. you know. So, so they might be going to a certain event that has nothing really to do with the arts, but then they see something that's there and, and then they get, you know, then they want to know more, you know, what right. else is available to us. And, you know, one, uh, we also, uh, you know, have uh, concerts and stuff. And, and we have, one time we had this uh, in our galleries, very traditional art from our uh, Arbor Gallery, a co-op of artists, local artists. And they sell their art in a lot of watercolors, a lot of, you know, acrylic, a lot of landscape. A lot of cows, you know, in our area, <laughs> and um, and we had one night a heavy metal rock band playing, and and the arbor gallerist or artist stayed because they thought, well, who knows, maybe someone want want to buy our art, and that was the biggest night they had. These and it was the it was the um, the heavy metal bands. The, the musicians themselves that saw the art that they loved, they connected somehow. And, you know, something that would, you wouldn't think, yeah. you know, jive. maybe it would jive. And yeah. it did. These yeah. guys loved the, the pieces of art that they bought, and, and oh. that was a great thing for, the, for our artists, yeah. our local artists. How do you ensure that, that your constituents own the problem, your communities own the problem of keeping, you, keeping art alive? It's building relationships. I mean, mm -hmm. when we all walked into our institutions not having been part of them before. At least I moved right. here for this job. And so I needed to start forging relationships. And I treat Fresno like a small town in a big city. 700,000 people live here. There's no way I can touch all of those people. But I do find out who cares. And I do cultivate those people. And they become friends of the museum and friends of the cause for culture. And it's a, it's a process. Um, I wasn't given a chunk of change and said, go do what you want, we trust you. I've had to raise it as I go. And I raise it to support the kinds of programs I think are relevant to this community. And it's a handful. I mean, we have some major donors. We have a membership that's cultivated constantly and renewed constantly. We write grants. We're, we have no city, state, or federal money, none. It's private individuals, private family foundations, and the community at large. So is it a combination of constant advocacy, mm -hmm. opportunism, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to figure out a way to create earned income experiences, try to figure out a way to cross-fertilize, mm -hmm. writing grants? And being worthy of their money. And we have to be worthy. Because we are stewards of the arts. We are so, stewards right. of the arts. We're stewards of their money. That's right. And um, as a nonprofit, we are responsible to those people. I've found that one of the, one of the principles, and there's a lot of them, um, that's important is we have to keep local artists engaged, working, collaborating, because when it's your neighbor who's exhibiting art, there's more investment. There's more connection. There's more story to that. And that helps our local people see the value of keeping their neighbor working, keeping their neighbor exhibiting, keeping their neighbor engaged. Um, so for 
those of us who are local art centers, it's really important to be able to cultivate the, the working artists in our own communities, to be exhibitors, to be their own best spokespeople for the arts in the neighborhood and to become partners with them. I, that's just one of the principles that I think are really significant for us. So important, so important to have a, a vital arts ecosystem here. It so improves everyone's lives. Bruce, Michelle, Colton, and Janelle, thank you so much for sharing the work of King's Arts Center, the Fresno Art Museum, the Merced Arts Council, and Arts Visalia. Thank you so much for explaining the world that you inhabit, and thank you so much for thank your you. insights. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.